brilliant. How are you anyway? Uh, I'm all right. Um, uh, everybody's been asking, you know, how, how I am. Um, uh, I think there are people who are climbing the walls, but you see, I'm used to being on the road. And uh, when you arrive in a, in a town, uh, maybe the day before a gig, you spend a lot of time on your own. So uh, yeah. I'm, quite, I'm quite happy in my own company. And, um, I'm, you know, there's always something that you can do. And a year in lockdown has just got me catching up with a lot of things that I, I, I had planned to do, but mainly to do with uh, sports and watching stuff on, on TV and um, maybe uh, finishing a couple of songs that I, I, I was messing with, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Oh, brilliant. Um, you first found success in 1971, 50 years ago. What factors would you say have contributed to the success of Sweet over the 50 years? Uh, right. I think the songs sound as fresh today as they did when they were recorded. Um, you can't say that about everything, but, but there was a lot of good stuff in the 70s that still sounds good today. Yeah. And I think that... Um, it's proving that way because there are um, f lots of film franchises that are starting to pick up 70s music again, which is yeah. good. Um, uh, I think that, um, you know, people weren't really touching the 70s after, after a certain um, guy who used to smoke cigars and wear tracksuits, you know, um, th that kind of thing happened. Yeah. Um, but... But, but I think that the music, you see, you, you, you can't deny it. It was, there, there was so, so, so many good bands, you know. I mean, there was Mark Boland with, with T-Rex. There was Slade. There was Susie Quattro. There was, um, and a little bit later, you had bands like Roxy Music and um, uh, the Electric Light Orchestra. And, yeah. you know, it, it, the list is, goes on and on. Then Dire, dire Straits and, think, you know. Yeah, it's um, one of my last events which I covered was the Planet Rock Winter's End. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, my God, what a show. <laughs> it was, I, I can honestly say, because I, I remember uh, Sweet because of my dad. I, I, I was born in the, in the early 70s, and my brother used to be like a DJ. So all sweet songs and um, all the, the dance tunes which were around in those days, I got to listen to. And when I was at Planet Rock, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is like a soundtrack to my 70s. And uh, I, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is brilliant. I, I left there, I, I put my Spotify on, I was driving home. After taking yeah. photos, and I was like, the, the, I had such a, a feel good factor leaving Winter's End that I thought, I, I it, this can't be beaten. It, it was just hit after hit after hit, <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, this is brilliant. Did yeah. um, did you play any uh, gigs after uh, Winter's End before COVID took over? Um, yeah, we. Um... We did, um, when was that? Was that the end of February? Or? I think it was February, the end, towards yeah. the end of February. Well, we went straight out to Denmark um, and did, uh, well, we were supposed to do two or three shows with Slade, but um, yeah. we, only did, we only did one um, because the, the next one was cancelled because all of a sudden everybody was making the decision that anything over a thousand people couldn't go ahead. And what they should have done was they should have said nothing can go ahead because, you know, even a thousand people was, was, was too many. Yeah. Um, but we, we had a gig cancelled in uh, Denmark and, uh, and we, all, uh, we all flew home. Um, yeah. And then um, we were in total lockdown and, and it was, uh, I, we could, you could see it coming because uh, when I was out in Germany with, um, I, I was a, a master of ceremonies and interviewer on a tour called Music and Stories with Uriah Heep, 
Wishbone Ash and Nazareth. Yeah. Um, and during that tour, I kept reading and seeing the news and things. You'd heard about this thing uh, before Christmas happening in, in China. And yeah. nobody was nobody was really taking it that seriously. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start reading, you know, the science scientists are starting to talk in the papers, you know, yeah. about how how this pandemic um, and, and then they traced. Remember, they traced the guy who came from um, who'd been out in China and he went straight to a skiing holiday and yeah. he spread it. He spread it amongst uh, a dozen people who all flew back to England who then yeah. spread it amongst another dozen people. And all of a sudden, we were in the middle of this, um, yeah. uh, this uh, shitstorm, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was so strange then, because you had Boris Johnson on TV every day just telling people to wash your hands and sing happy birthday. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like, and I got confused. I, I forgot what day my bloody birthday was on afterwards because I was singing every day. But it just spread. I. My very last um, event before full lockdown was the week that uh, they were having an hour and they were going to announce it on, I think, on a Friday. And I, I was meeting Louise Redner and, yes. yeah. and went backstage and all that. And it was such a strange atmosphere because it was like, right, do we hug? Um, have we got a... Um, it felt first, and it was so, so strange because nobody seemed to know what was going on. And then it was her final show because the rest got cancelled. Yeah. And, uh, it was, um, it just took so hold so quickly. Yeah. Um, well, I'm a Welshman. I'm just trying to pick your accent. You're, are you South? Yeah. Yeah, from the Valleys. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'm, uh, the Chester side. I'm Wrexham, you know. Um, what is it they say? Um, almost English. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think so. I remember years ago you used to call it North of England. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I remember us on our bikes being able to go down to the River Dee, uh, where the old Roman bridge was in Farndon, yeah. uh, and and swim in the river there. And you'd go over the bridge on your bikes and, and go, hey, we're in England. And then, <laughs> and then come back across and then cycle home, you know? Yeah. It's um, like down here, we've got uh, so many roads which uh, you could cross into England. And yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, you see, the, you see the sign and you're driving and go, right, good England. Because half the time, if I'm going, I'm um, leaving yeah. Wales just for concerts. Well, so, when I was... Uh, when I was growing up in the 50s, um, initially, um, and my dad, I remember him having one of these big um, Vauxhall Cresters that, where the roof would come down. And we'd all pile into it on a Sunday because Wales was dry. And it was, on, it was only like five miles up the Chester Road where you crossed into England. And there were three or four pubs absolutely packed. <laughs> you know, and we would sit outside for a, a couple of hours, um, you know, crisps and pop. Uh, and the same thing happened um, down in the Forest of Dean when we were, uh, that was in the s mid to late 70s uh, with Sweet. We, we would uh, go to a place called Clearwell Castle to rehearse and record. We take a mobile studio there. And on a Sunday, they were still um, in um, in Wales. Th th there were still um, pubs that um, th that would close, you know, yeah. on a on a Sunday. And and our local pub, which, which was more of a like a restaurant, um, and the pub we we liked to go to was in Wales. But but there was a pub that if you drove on the Welsh side and parked, you could walk across this rickety bridge. And on the other side of the road was a was a pub that was, you know, uh, heaving, you know. So, uh, so I think I think uh, the um, the the whatever kind of the Welsh brethren missed a trick in the fifties because oh. you know they could they could have had all all that tax off off the demon alcohol, you know. <laughs> yeah, 
it's uh, I'm not sure if it was all because of religion. I'm not sure, but it's uh, it, it it came to a point where eventually it did come yeah. about that, and it's one of those things now where everyone just crams in it on a Sunday. Yeah, well, when w w when they finally overturned it, um, Anglesey still decided to remain dry. Um, and, and the worst thing about that was my mum and dad had a caravan on Anglesey. So in order to get a drink, you either had to go into a hotel, which you could, you could go into the, one of the big hotels in Beaumaris, or you go across the um, Menai Straits on the bridge to a pub in Carnarvon or, or Bangor, you know? <laughs> well, all I used to do was encourage people to, uh, to uh, drive and have a, a little uh, drink as well. <laughs> yeah, it was the era of that, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so what, what is this? What are you? Um, are, are you, are you a, a community radio or are you a... You know? oh, what, what it is... Um, this is therapy to a lens, and yeah. I'm ex British Army. Uh, I've served all over the country in a lot of the hostile locations. Yeah. And in 2012, I was diagnosed with PTSD and mental illness through my time. I've been in Iraq, Northern Ireland, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo. So, one of the things which uh, I was struggling. I, I lost my love of music. I didn't know anything about um, about the condition. I was struggling in so many ways. And one day I went out and I took a photograph and I put it on Facebook. And so many people around was going, oh my God, that's a beautiful photo. And I was like, I couldn't see it. I, I really, uh, it was like it, with blinkers on. And uh, so I went out, I took some more, and more people were telling me. So I went out and I bought my first camera. And uh, I got in contact with uh, Marganum was playing in my town, Narvada. And I got in contact with them and they said, yeah, you could come and photograph it. And to be quite honest, <laughs> I went there and I had this, uh, it was like a 200 pound camera. I thought it was brilliant, to be honest. And then there was all these other photographers there with these massive lenses, and I felt really, really <laughs> like uh, I, I need to improve on this. And um, so I started reaching out, and I set up my website. And uh, all it was was to um, interview, well, to start it off with photography, with music photography, and just going around taking photographs or whatever because it was helping my PTSD. So then with that, uh, my, uh, one of my friends turned around and put on Facebook, does anybody want, uh, is interested in interviewing uh, the band Heat? And I went, oh, I'll give it a shot. And I interviewed them and then more was coming. And when I was reaching out and I put my story down, to say, look, um, this is what I was. This is where I am. Um, I want. I'd like to bring uh, awareness to PTSD and mental illness, um, especially with veterans, um, through music and film. And it, it just exploded. The amount of um, promotion companies. Uh, for some strange reason, I am got a clue. I've got this Hilux, <laughs> and I've got like six record labels on it: uh, Napalm Records, Metal Blade uh, Records, and uh, quite a few UK ones. And I'm like, oh my god, this has gone absolutely crazy. And uh, so I reached out to Planet Rock, and they said, yes, sir, he come down. So I started reviewing concerts as well as photographing them. And then I started interviewing um, artists, only written to start with. And then I built up the coverage. And now I'm interviewing the likes of legends like yourself. So it's uh, that's what it is. And 
it's the bring awareness. So right. uh, well, well, you have my ultimate respect because you know, help for heroes and all that other stuff is um uh it needs all the help that it can get. And um it's I guess you've got to treat them like what what you had, you've got to treat it like an injury, haven't you? You know, yes. with, you know. It, it's uh um it's it's horrible. My um uh my job in the army, uh I was an ambulance driver in Belize. Uh, when I went to Northern Ireland, I was uh, a staff car driver. I used to drive the officers to some hostile locations um, where top IRA, um, I, I had death threats off the IRA uh, because um, I was involved in a car accident. And when I went to court, um, because uh, the police took the other person to court because of a reckless driving, and I had to go as a witness. And it was at the same time where all of the Republicans and the IRA were at the courthouse because of riots to do with the marches. And they recognised me. And uh, the most intimidating thing I have ever had in my life, and I say this to every single person who tries to intimidate me, you, you won't intimidate me, but the simple fact is I have sat there and I've had three IRA, one the top notch of London Derby Brigade, come up to me and go, <laughs> and making bomb sounds. And, go, <laughs> and at the time, the police, which were in the courthouse, took myself, took my sergeant, which I came over, and my escort, and we were put in the cupboard <laughs> to, uh, it was a, a room, but it was the size of a cupboard. And uh, we were put in there for our own safety because, uh, and I think it was about four weeks after that, I was posted out of Northern Ireland because I was, my unit was told that I was a target. Yeah, risk, risk factor, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, and so well I, have to say, I, I have to say um, that... Um, you know anybody who um, uh, who just doesn't understand the world? You know, I mean, for me, without uh, people like people like yourself, we would be in a much much different place here. You know, um, and I still think that regardless of of what we think might might happen to actually have um an army a navy and, a, and an air force it, it's yeah. vital to our survival last um last thursday i was sleeping on the streets of cardiff uh to bring awareness and to raise money for the royal british legion industries um which is older than the royal british legion uh, to bring awareness to homeless soldiers, which um, our government have left behind. I, I don't really want to go into politics, but no, no. But with um, so I was sleeping on the streets of Cardiff last uh, last week, and uh, I was it was cold and very. Yeah. I, I don't bloody, know what people could do it. It was blood, bloody cold inside. Never mind that side. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and I have to say that it, it's appalling, you know, when you read read these stories about, you know, um, uh, even even to, to the extent of, you know, historic things of going back and trying to pick the bones of whether somebody shot something in the right way. I mean, come on, yeah. W what happens in in war? You know, uh, yeah. You you, you can't you you can't start apportioning blame you're there to protect you know yeah. and do, do the best you can that's it that's yeah. what it is it's um like when i uh, went to kosovo i was an explosive search dog under so i was out looking for in kosovo it was um like weapons and things like that from the mafia which would um, bring it over the borders from serbia 
and uh, uh, and down southway uh, towards Greece and things like that. They used to bring it up through. Uh, um, when I went to Iraq, I was an explosive search dog handler in Baghdad, and I had uh, a number of occasions um, where I thought within a second my life was over. Um, and just I, I, I don't want to go into the graphic details, but one incident which people don't don't realize, I was searching a car and the two American soldiers which were supposed to be there to protect me were talking and the driver had his car keys and then just pressed the central lock in while I was in there and I froze because I was waiting for the blast and what people don't realize is because that nickel second he pressed that button we all could have been dead yeah. and a bloke thought it was funny. Um, I certainly didn't. <laughs> but no. that was one incident out there which people don't realize. And yeah. uh, but it's um therapy to a lens is just it's just taken off. It's just yeah, yeah. No, no, I'll I, I I shall investigate this when we're done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, and um, you know, uh we've all got um uh not me personally but countries have got things that we we have to resolve otherwise the the world will always be dangerous won't won't it you know yeah it definitely it's i think sometimes things get allowed to happen to a point where um it could have been resolved a lot sooner but yeah, and, and and let's not talk about this recent you know royal situation <laughs> let's oh. just leave that alone <laughs> yeah no I, I i i pardon me with that the only thing i will say is that because of harry yeah serving in in afghanistan i give him every respect because Absolutely. he's been there and he's put the life on the line and the media could have cost him his life by reporting that he was out there, and yeah, 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 uh, I I read that, and that's wrong. He had to be removed, didn't he, or something? Yeah, yeah, they removed him. Um, he yeah. went back out again, but they pleaded with the the media because they put it all over. It. Happy in Afghanistan, yeah. and, and I, all of all, I actually think though he does look like a, a different person now um, from yeah. the. From that happy, smiling, you know, happy-go-lucky, yeah. you know, up for anything guy, he yeah. he seems he seems to have all of a sudden, you know, there's um, uh, and nobody knows yet, you know, it'll all come out though. I think it'll all come out. Yeah, you know? it's it's crazy because you've got Piers Morgan, which is this outspoken person. Well, that State. hasn't helped, does it? No, and and he's talking in the media and then saying that what someone else is saying about the media is lies, and you're like, well, you were, you, you were yeah. the one saying it. But uh, the, only, the only thing I will say here is everybody's entitled to an opinion. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I agree with uh, the Queen that they shouldn't have done that interview. It could no. have been sort, sorted out differently. Yeah. Um, but right. I think it's like having your day in court. I think she wanted, this is her medium, you know, uh, TV, yeah. film. You know, she's an actress. Yeah. And I think she thought that that is my day now. Uh, yeah. If we, if we do this, everybody will see the light. Yeah. And I'm afraid... You only have to look historically back at all these people who've done those, um, you know, tell-all type interviews. Yeah, it don't it don't always work, you know. No, it's. I think I can understand from Harvey's point of view because of what happened with his mother, and he wants to protect his wife and his child. I think yeah. with Megan, I think it's a case of 
there's a lot of I think there's a lot of issues there which I think she needs to uh, to deal with from her own family to mm. the family yeah. she's married into. Well, well, it, Harry's family is almost estranged like her family is to her. Yeah. And that yeah. that is that is something that should not happen. Family is everything then, you know. Yeah. It's it's crazy how, how like Harry was this huge um savior in one sense because he, he brought in Victor's games. Oh so, aren't, aren't they fantastic, you know? Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. And he'd served in the, in Afghanistan and people looked at him and thought, yes. Yeah. And all that is seen is like it's gone now. Mm. It, it, people are turning on him and forgetting about all the good which he has done. Yeah. And I, I I seen a few um comments the other day from soldiers go away um really slagging him off. And I'm thinking this, this is a guy which you know, you were comrades or comrades, yeah, of yeah. <laughs> but you were you were friends and served with it, with this yeah. guy. He was an Apache pilot, and you you turned in your back. He's done all this for um, soldiers with disabilities. He's created this games which everyone around the world is taking part in. Yeah, um, uh, you you because he's defended his wife. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here, here we are. I said, let's not talk about that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. You uh, can't help yourself, you know. No, no. It's. I, I, I do agree with you. There is something which shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been done. Um, but I can see it from Marvy's point of view. I really yeah. can. Um, I mean, look, look. I, I, I don't normally believe in PR or, um, you know, I, I, I believe that. You know, I should be able to um, uh, tell my agent to call a few people and then all of a sudden word gets around. But in this yeah. particular case, coming out of lockdown and the fact that Peter, you know, Peter Noble, yeah. our, the guy, he is the PR for our tour. And I just said to him, you don't want to see what you can do with the single. Well, my God, I have to tell you... Um, I wasn't expecting this avalanche. I'm doing seven interviews today, <laughs> and you're you're number two, and I'm already, you know, thinking, what am I going to say in the third one? You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the strange thing about it is, I bought all last night. I was writing all these questions down to ask, and I think. Well, I've go on then. Go on. <laughs> no, it's it's been absolutely um, fantastic to. Because I, I haven't so far um, in all the interviews, um, I think one person, one other person um, has asked me about their beautiful lens. So thank you for, uh, yeah. for asking because this is why I, I kind of do it to bring awareness. And uh, it's been... It's been, one of, it's been one of those interviews where I'm going to go back and go back. Uh, when I uh, upload it, uh, <laughs> I might as well throw that away uh, because <laughs> these ain't the questions which we are. Uh, well, the we... thing is, um, talking about things is a kind of therapy, isn't it? You know, yeah, isn't, oh, it, definitely. Is, isn't that what everybody should do? Yeah. You know, um, I remember um, growing up in North Wales, uh, if anybody had a problem um, when you were of a certain age, uh, you'd go down the pub with your dad and sort it out, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, but there was a quote uh, the other day by uh, Mike Tyson, and he said, we live in an age now where anyone can um, spit on your face uh, and not get a punch in the face. But uh, they can destroy you, um, slag you off, bully you, and... They, they can do it, and you're not in a position where you can say, do you know what, I'm going to smack you in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those days have gone. Yeah. Well, when I was growing up, a clip round the ear from a, from a teacher or a policeman solved a hell of a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, uh, I, I remember I was talking to my uh, brother about it, and I said, oh, 
because uh, one of our teachers in school, he would take the cane across your knuckles. Yeah. And what, you know, what damage that probably caused in later yeah. years. Like, but you're thinking, yeah. I, I just took her. I remember one teacher thought I was taking him, uh, the mickey out of uh, a girl because she had a neck brace on. And I weren't. I just scratched my neck. And he thought I was taking it. And he punched me in the face. And, wow. and I, I was like, Okay, what was all that about? <laughs> and another teacher, he, had, he was in uh, the days where they would um, do in dinner break, would go down the pub and have a few pints and then come back. And uh, one of the boys in metal work had been messing around with the, the thing and wrote um, this boy's name. And he thought it was me. And he offered me outside to fight me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it was like, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to upset and fight my teacher. Yeah, it, it, drunk. It, it makes my gra grammar school look a bit like a nunnery then, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there it, it were was, a few things that happened then. Yeah, it's uh, it's just so crazy. Like, you look back and you think, good God, teachers now were so... Well, it's even in the, in the military. With yeah. um, recruits now, or I don't know if it's changed as of now, but going back a few years, they had a yellow and red card. And this was the recruits. And if they thought that one of the instructors was going over the top, it, it would give them either a yellow card or a red what, card. like a referee? Yeah. And the yellow card, they would have to go and um, be in front of the commanding officer to explain his actions to this recruit. And the red card, if they showed the red card, then they would be pulled away from it and investigated. And you, so, you can't have so, that in the military. So, so the old regimental sergeant major used to bark out stuff as long <laughs> as gone, is he? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think um, I, I joined the army in 91 and I look back on my basic training and I laugh because we, uh, I remember pulling up at the station in um, Brookwood uh, by Aldershot, not, not far from Aldershot. Uh, Deep Cup Barracks was there. And uh, I remember pulling up and I uh, had our bags and we came down and there was this big black sergeant there. And he turned around and he said, is there any of you, any of you, would you like some help? And one boy went, oh yes, please, <laughs> well. <laughs> He was <laughs> screaming at us all, and we were like, well, I, I remember getting to the camp, and I went straight to the phone, and I said, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that boy regretted it. <laughs> yeah. But he thought, oh, he's being nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'll never I, forget it. Like, ah, he was, he was solid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember my dad was uh, only 15, right at the end of uh, World War II. He went to, um, he, he went and signed up. He wasn't old enough. And yeah. they accepted him because he, he lied about his age. And he got, I think he was, ended up at Catterick, some, somewhere like that. Yeah. Uh, after a couple of weeks, he phoned my grandfather, his father, and said, can you get me out of this? And he went, nope. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and he, he had to do, the first six months before they sign you up for real. Yeah. And that's it. As my dad said, that six months taught him a lot, you know? Yeah. It's, um, it, it's funny because there was people in, uh, in my recruit, which uh, said, no, that's it. I, I'm not doing it. Uh, I want, uh, I want to leave. And they said, right, fair enough. So they pulled them out of uh, the basic training site. And uh, they were there longer than we were, which had done our training, and we had gone to postings and everything, and they were still there being used. Yeah. And uh, but that's uh, the the crazy craziness about it. And I look mm. at basic training now, and I go, if anyone asks me, I say it's the best time of my life because yeah. I had this really strong Welsh accent, and they took the Mickey out of it, and they. I felt that I was appreciated only because they were taking the mickey out of me because I just, 
that one uh, one funny story. We were there, and uh, the uh, corporal and the sergeant came in, and uh, we had had our bed blocks all done up on on the room, and uh, it was a locker inspection, and it was about I think it was about two weeks before we passed out, and. Uh, the sergeant turned around and uh, he said to his boy, he said, what have you made this with a fucking hand grenade? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> we were, so I was there like, uh, now trying not to laugh. And he said to this boy, he said, right, make you a boots fly. So he picked up his boots and he threw them out of the window. And uh, we were quite high up in one of the blocks and shattered and he was, he was nearly in tears. He, was, he had paid, done so much to make these boots look like the way. And he said to another one, and he said, um, you, make your boots fly. So he picked his boots up and dropped them on the bed. And the sergeant turned around and he said, why did you throw your boots out of the air your window? <laughs> He's just that, there, and uh, his boots are all right. And he was distraught, this boy was. He was nearly in tears because he thought, oh, my God, there was beds thrown out of the bloody windows and all that. Oh, it was funny. I, I, and I just well, looked at it that way. Well... I guess um, you know the um, you're probably going to face worse, you know, when when you get involved with 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 where you were going, it, it, especially some of those some of those places that you mentioned. Yeah. You know the you know that when Yugoslavia started to split like that, yeah. You know, um, the, the, I think um, I, I think you could you could lay a fair amount of um, uh, blame. On on the Serbians because they had the artillery and the and, the, and yeah. the power and the you know and 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 you can't believe what fellow what man can do to fellow men can you you know yeah there's uh, I'm trying to think in the name of the film uh, right the name of the film is called Saviour and there's Dennis Quaid in it yeah. and I tell people if you want to see a film which is so close to reality, watch that film because it is, um, uh, he, he goes and joins the French Foreign Legion uh, and he's a mercenary out in, um, out in Bosnia. Um, but it shows what, what was happening out yeah. there. And when uh, it goes into the mass graves, side of it and how it would happen and I, I tell people because a lot of people ask me about or oh, what films can I watch which would highlight PTSD and I say to them if you want to watch a film American Sniper because yeah. that I've seen that yeah yeah and that highlights a soldier which is got to do something which is not good yeah and um uh, it's there's so many good films out there which don't get the the, um, uh, yeah. the features which they should do because like I say with Saviour if you watch it and you go oh my god and that's what it was like out there mm. and uh, but it's yeah it, it, you, you've got to be prepared for what's going on and I think a lot of the things which are happening with our forces now is because things have changed so much that yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you have to say that if a drone or something of that ilk is going to resolve a problem that it doesn't mean loss of life, yeah, you'll do it, won't you? You know. Well, that that's that's the thing. I worked with the Americans for twelve months in Baghdad, and. Uh, we had uh, suicide bombers go off, and but I was working on a camp, uh, Camp Slayer, and it was the Sneaky Beaky Camp. You had the SAS there, you had the Special Signals, um, which was dealing with, uh, which was with the CIA, the FBI, the, uh, uh, the other um, uh, spe secret things to do with Americans and all that. And we were always, we knew when Saddam Hussein was coming in to be, in there, to be interrogated, because we were always told, turn around and face the wall. 
But you'd well, always have a little look over your shoulder and you should see the convoy coming in and it would be, you, you would think, oh my God, it'd be about eight, eight trucks, all with that big uh, 50 calibers on to make sure that, and it was only going from one side of the road to the other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stories there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I, this has been fascinating, you know? Oh, it's been great. It's been great to talk yeah. to somebody about it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, anyway. I, I, had, I had two uncles, um, both called Jeff, would you believe, from both sides of my, my grandparents' family. Um, yeah. And um, they both went into the army and, and did national service, you know, after. Yeah. Uh, in the 50s. And yeah. they used to they used to say to me, um, for for want of anything else, you could and because I'd been to grammar school, they were they were like saying, "Look, you're intelligent. You could you could pro probably go down an officer's route or something like that." Yeah. And and but by that time, thank God, uh, I'd learned that I could play a bit of guitar, and people were interested in what I was doing. You know. Yeah. So, so you're, I, you're you know you'd be surprised yeah you'd be surprised how your music gets people through um situations like when before i would go out on a, a patrol or if i was going to do some searches i'd, I'd listen to kiss and i'd listen to that i would get myself mentally prepared sometimes i'd listen to wasp and uh i would wasp what's yeah. called uh, blackie yeah I've, I've met him a few times you know he's uh he's a strange one <laughs> yeah I, I, I remember when he first came over to england he played somewhere in in the midlands and my mate who was his record company uh came over from new york and we went up to see them uh in this well it was a, a gig that you, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't put wasp in in this particular place it was like a mecca ballroom you know one of these yeah. locarno type ballroom and i went backstage and i realized that this thing that he used to wear that this jock strap thing it wasn't yeah. plastic it was real yeah. <laughs> I, I said to him haven't you? he said oh many times he said i've i've caught caught my guitar on it or caught my hand on it and i yeah. went well, man, you need to change that to, to plastic, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, I, I, I've, I've gone to see him quite a few times and uh, a few concerts have been cancelled on the spot because um, he didn't like the stage or he didn't, uh, he asked for a Pacific um, curtain to be put up and the, the venue had forgot to put the curtain up, so... His manager be going, oh, come on, there's a massive queue of people outside. You, you, you've got to go and do the gigs. But my last thing I'm, I'm going to say, I was doing, talking about that in the military and, and the past. I did a, um, I, I look back into my uh, family history and uh, I was always told by my dad that my grandfather was one of the first people in World War I. One of, he was a part of uh, the Pembrokeshire Yeomanry. And they right. were attached to um, another unit. But I only found out the other day that a great uncle of mine was Al Roach, the um, film director. Oh, right. And uh, 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 Laurel and Hardy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was so, so shocked about it. I was like, oh, my God. And I'd be looking into the history and going, this, oh God, he, this guy is massive because... Mm. Our relatives originally came from Ireland and they split ones came to Pembroke and the others went to New York and his family went to New York and right. <laughs> I'm like, good God, I've got, I've got connections to Laurel and Arnie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a museum up in, I think it's Oldswater, where uh, Stan Laurel was from originally. Um, and they, you know, it, it's the Laurel and Hardy Museum, and it's it's a fantastic little 
you know, little oh. venture, you know. I, I've got to go. I've, I've got to go and uh, learn more about it because it's yeah. it, it's just something which I was so shocked about because I, I knew about my other grandfather being in World War One. That was a shock to find out that he was one of the... Um, and I only found out because of his number, his regiment number. Wow. Because then he'd have like one, two, three and all his business. And he was like 526 or something like that it was. And I was thinking, oh, my God, that's a really early number. Mm. And uh, But anyway, but you've got other interviews. So I yes, will let you go. Um, uh, wait a minute. So, yes, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of lunch. And my next one starts at about two o'clock. Well, good luck with it, and I hope they uh, they have got enough stories to tell you themselves. Yeah. Well, uh, thank um, you so much, Chris. This has been not what I expected, but it's been great, you know. Awesome. And I will, I will now check out the th therapy through a lens. Yeah, and... the lens is spelled L-E-N-S-E. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it'll be here. Yeah. And uh, and I'll um, uh, I'll I'll try and put a link up uh, either on Facebook or on the website to just say, you know, Brilliant. have a look, you know. And uh, I I spoke to uh, Peter the other day, and uh, so I I'll be coming down to Cardiff and that uh, sweet play Cardiff. So okay, I, I'll come and Great. say hello. Uh, I'm not sure where we're playing there, but um, I you think know. it's the um... oh, it's it's the college, isn't it? Is it a college or is it's part, it um, part of the uni, isn't it? I'm not sure. I, or is it the um, Cardiff uh, St. David's Hall? Uh, it's the University SU, Student oh, brilliant. Union. Brilliant. Yeah. So I'll come yeah. and say a, a lot to you then. Yeah, I've played the St. David's Hall many, many, many times in, in my life, you know. Yeah. I first saw Wasp, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Right. It was uh, the stage show was all cardboard except him. <laughs> well, the, the last time I was there, it it, it, it could have done with a it, done with a little bit of um, revamp. You know, it was yeah. looking a little bit um, second hand. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I used to go there all the time uh, for record fairs. Yeah. Because uh, I, I one of the questions I was going to say to you, I just, literally. Last night bought um, your new album, the uh, Coca Cola bottle version. Oh right! So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to having that. It's uh, right. I, I, one thing I do. I, I just love vinyl. You can't beat vinyl. Yeah. Don't you? Oh yeah, these guys in America have have done a great job. You know. Yeah, I'm looking forward uh, to it. It's a great package. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I'll let you go and have your lunch. Great. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much for this. This has yeah. been brilliant. All right. Take care. Cheers, man. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.